The language strategy is is a. There's 22 separate uh, initiatives within uh, within it. Um, some of them are programs. Some of them are initiatives or or, or focuses. Uh, the the strategy itself was developed, as I was saying earlier, through our former partnership or our partnership with uh, Mike Parkhill and Say It First when we were at the Rainy River Board and there was the Ministry of Ed, Rainy River Board, the 10 First Nations and 7 Gens. We embarked on creating resources for teachers, uh, our native language teachers, so they can then spend two, three, four hours a night trying to create resources for their classes. So, and that worked fantastic. There was a number of books created, uh, uh, you know, technical type of uh, tools such as Erasma and that it helps uh, with fluency and things like that but one of the things that we found with that strat and uh, with that is it wasn't creating more speakers it was basically having really good resources created for our language teachers and so um, and what we so we took a step back and what we saw is that uh, you know our our great language teachers team within the Rainy River Board, well they weren't getting any younger and there was no farm team to help them out uh, to to carry on and sustain the cor- the program. So we created this strategy. Mike and I talked about some of the issues and and we went back to the drawing board and and then we approached the Ministry of Ed and. And others and our First Nations and got uh, band council resolutions to support it. And, uh, you know, thankfully the uh, Ministry of Ed, uh, EDU, K-12 unit supported this. And so we're off and running. We're, we're <laughs> about eight months into it. And, uh, you know, there's all these different programs from adult immersion to uh, um the mentor apprentice to uh, uh, a thing called the conjugation tool, which is uh, a tool that's uh, created where um, it will be one of Ojibwe language will be one of the 120 five or 26 languages that Microsoft will support. So meaning what that means is instead of saying file, edit and all that, it will all be in Ojibwe. Mm -hmm. And so those are, those are some of the things that are coming from it. Like when I say initiatives, uh, probably the program right now that's uh, garnered the most attention has been the adult immersion where, you know, within the strategy, each of the 10 first nations, uh, were to, they, uh, chose a candidate to become a fluent speaker and be paid to do it within a three year time frame. And so the strategy supported that. But what we found was a number of the first nations wanted, uh, you know, a second and third person to, to be part of this and they're paying for that themselves. And so, you know, it, it really shows the importance that they, that language has on our communities because it's the basis of the culture. If, if the language goes, there is no more culture. There isn't, there isn't things such as ceremony and, and, uh, you know, protocols, uh, that are, that are done in the language only that there's things that you can't translate literally into English when you're talking Ojibwe. And so that's why, it, 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 to me, Seven Gens and, and, you know, the Rainy River Board, along with the First Nations and the Ministry of Ed, we've, we've, we've partnered on this. And it's probably a greater purpose than just programs and that. It's about helping communities with their language and culture and helping that survive so they have that identity of they're from Negegusa Manikaning, then, you know, these are some of the, you know, uh, and, you know, lots of people talk about the different dialects and this and that. And, and within the strategy, we'll be able to account for that as well, because, um, you know, as, as the folks are in the adult immersion, the mentor apprentice, they'll be paired with elders and resource people from their community. So they're going to learn their dialect and, and it, there are little, uh, differences in that, uh, but there's lots of similarities too. So, so we're really, I mean, the language strategy is just going to be a, a game changer for our communities and, and for our people. And I think one of the things that's important about it is that we, 
you know, for our for our uh, young young ones that live on our communities, uh, them being having access to language and culture, it will help strengthen them as students and as people within their community because that's who that's who they are. You know, we we haven't uh, uh, Seven Gens has never uh, changed its philosophy around culture, language, and and those types of things for providing those for our students because. That's what our communities ask for, and that's what we tr- we have to deliver on. Because if if we don't, we're just a we're just a, a mainstream institute mm-hmm. with an indigenous name, right. <laughs> you know. Yeah, right. So we really want to. Uh, this strategy is going to be a game changer. It's going to help create uh, things that uh, are needed, like teachers, for example. So uh, public school boards can. Uh, sustain programs. It's going to create opportunities for uh, adult immersion folks to, for example, right next door to us is the Health Access Center, where there's lots of elders that struggle with English. So there's translator jobs. Mm-hmm. There's there's lots of different things that are available. And you just look at like Lakehead University or colleges and that, where you know they probably are in the same boat as public school boards trying to find fluent speakers to sustain their programs. So I think it's re- going to be a real win win for for our for Northwestern Ontario Treaty Three and then also, you know, for Thunder Bay and helping with their language program and, and the education program. So hmm. there's quite a bit. Uh, one of the things within uh, prior to the strategy we've been doing with the Anishinaabemo and Immersion Program and our partnership with Sioux College and you know there there's there's lots of good things that have been happening with that and connecting various elders and resource people from around the area it's been awesome we've had you know our own uh, uh, culture and language guy and Robert Horton he's been uh, teaching in that as well and uh, the challenge with that one is just because it's weekend based so you know fluency is created with anywhere between 15 to 20 hours a week uh, speaking in the language and it's hard to get that if you're running it every second weekend and so the, you know the focuses of that have changed a bit on how we can make it fit and make it work because most of the candidates in that have full-time jobs during the week right. so obviously they're not going to quit that to so we, we, we got to look at different ways to deliver those types of things, uh, whether it's at night or whatever. Um, you know, one of the things we're going to tie in is the adult uh, immersion uh, f- uh, program that we started with the strategy with the with this partnership with Sioux College. So they gain the certificates and that as well, even though it's 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 kind of delivered in a different way so there's there's lots of different things happening in a nutshell you know the strategy without uh i guess one of the things i I didn't touch on in strategy was the mentor apprentice program which is a huge uh part of it as well uh that will help create sustainability with school boards in northwestern ontario by building fluent speakers that are teachers and and you know lu supporting that and the board's supporting that because when they're done their their education and their schooling, there's a job waiting for them, and mm. it's 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 uh, it's going to be a really uh, I, I can't wait to see it in action because um, they're going to be able to spend time uh, scheduled time with elders and resource people. They'll be learning off the land. They'll be learning things in the language, and and uh, to have young students graduating from grade 12 and fluent in the language it's awesome yeah. that's 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 a really important part of it as well and it and you know for the rainy river board or boards in thunder bay having this bank of uh you know young fluent ojibwe teachers it's even at the elementary level because you know if you're building teachers to teach obviously in the elementary schools as well there's that the, everything's connected and that's what I had mentioned there's 22 different initiatives but they're all we, we drew it on the board one day how they're all connected from resource development another big part of the strategy is uh, the early years and working with daycares so uh, working with the, the, P, the ECE workers there and the folks that work in there on language uh, uh, 
strategies and skills and and having those young folks coming out of daycares going into school that have a knowledge base of the language and and you know they're going to do better you Um, know and so like I said it's all connected in some way you know even the conjugation tool for you know I mentioned about so what I didn't expand on that so if you type in I want to go to the store and hit conjugate it'll come up every possible sentence in Ojibwe will be accounted for wow. and it's running through scripts and that it's a pretty it's pretty technical in how we did this but we're about a uh, couple years away from having this thing launched mm-hmm. and um, so it's and once we're there Microsoft will adopt it and and we're off and running so so if you're in Germany and you however you say I want to go to the store in German and hit translate to Ojibwe it'll translate it to Ojibwe too you know one of the things that we've been seeing uh, on our communities and working specifically on the language is that you know the the number of speakers are, are going down because what, what you see now is there's a generation that grew up without the language and now they they have kids and, and they isn't spoken at home and those types of things. So uh, the greater purpose around the strategy is to help our communities survive in terms of uh, their identity, uh, their ability to um you know, do ceremonies and practice uh, culture and language because, you know, as as our elders pass on, you know, there's a knowledge base that just is gone once, you know, if eh, so we need to somehow help our communities uh, work with that uh, and make sure that they there's that knowledge base that is passed on to generations below. And, and it's difficult to pass it on if you're not a speaker, if you're not... Uh, if you're not practicing the culture and, and those, those, uh, those are just key areas that, you know, and I'm not going to say that seven gens is a savior, but we're just, we're just an equal partner with every one of the 10 first nations here. So if they need us to help them with whatever, we, we try our best to do that. If we need them to help us with whatever, they try their best to do that. And so it's, like I said, it's a shared responsibility, um, Seven Gens has some means to help support the communities, uh, whether it's uh, access to native language program at LU or the adult immersion. We're just a mechanism to help help uh, build those types of things within the community. So that's mm-hmm. to me, it's a greater purpose uh, is just mm-hmm. our is to have meaningful um, input and and facilitation and supports for our communities and language and culture is a key for for the survival of of our communities but also for the survival of seven gens because that's who we are we're built around the language and the culture and and you know people are well how do you do language and culture and welding or whatever and i always say you know you look at it this way is that you know we have the language and culture as our basis how do you build welding around that into that and think of it the other way around and that's that's how we approach things i think the strategy is going to take you know a couple of years to measure the success of it because again you know bumps in the roads like finding uh you know fluent speakers to teach in the adult immersion program for example or to teach in the language strategy uh a program um so i think you know it will be a few years before we start seeing the the results i i one of the things that uh to judge how you're doing as an institute is to talk to the students um you can put all the ads up you want and wherever arenas and everything else. But if the students are coming out of there and saying to the next person, you know what? I just graduated from seven gens. It was awesome. They supported me. That's the key. That's the key is your, is your, uh, is what the students think of your Institute and how you've helped them. And, uh, other, because, if you're not, if they're not happy or say they, you know, I wouldn't go there. The program wasn't that great or whatever, then you're really not doing it. So their opinion is the only one that really matters. 
in, mm-hmm. in my opinion. I mean, we may think we're doing what we need to do, but if the students aren't uh, saying it wasn't a positive experience or it wasn't what they thought it would be. So, you know, we, we work continually to make our programs better, to, to have accountability. So when they graduate from here, whether it's in social work or whatever, they can go out into the world, into society, get a job and be successful at that. That's the, that's the telling tale. Well, Indigenous education is a lot of things. Uh, one of the things that we created here is, uh, um, well, the position always, always uh, existed, but it's a lang- language and cultural facilitator. And what we've done with that position is uh, through partnerships with one of our economic economic development corporations, or Onakajigan, we deliver cultural engagement training to every employee that works at the new New Gold Mine. So it's either a four-hour session or an eight-hour session. Um, from that, it's expanded where, you know, uh, Riverside Healthcare wanted all their workers to go through it. Uh, you know, uh, the city of Kenora, for example, the mayor and his council and all the people that work for the city of Kenora went through sessions. It's, it's part of our job is to help people understand, you know, maybe why the relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities, you know, in some areas aren't aren't positive or or why are they working in some areas and those types of things so it's really important that we help with the education of of not only non-indigenous people but it, it, first nation communities as well so we we continue to uh, build on that uh, that's an important role for uh, for what we do um, one of the things we ran the Aboriginal teacher edu- education program for years in a partnership with Queens. And when you go into, there was a number, lots of non-Indigenous uh, uh, people came through this program. But if you go in their classrooms now, you'll see a reflection of if there's 50% First Nation students in their classroom, you'll see a reflection whether it's on the wall or and how they deliver or what the focuses are on and who their guest speakers are. Why? Because they just know better. They went through a, they went through something that uh, kind of wherever it clicked in their head that, you know what, if I got 50% First Nation students or more in my classroom, I got to do things in there that they can connect with. And it's really important that that's, you know, as, you know, I remember going, well, I don't remember a lot of my formal education, but I I, I don't remember a lot about First Nations people other than, you know, you see that big book right there, <laughs> the Canada's yeah. Native People. Yeah. Like that, that was, was that was it, and and a lot of it is is misconceptions or half truths and those types of things. So uh, we know more now, and we, you know, um, so it's it's it, that's that's one of our roles as Seven Gens is to partner with whether it's businesses or or school boards or whatever to to help work together. Uh, you know, one of one of the things that I remember being asked uh, probably about ten years ago, uh, down in Toronto, I was I was there with the school board for something. They asked me, "What what do you think in a successful Indigenous student looks like?" And I said, "Well, that's kind of an interesting question, uh, you know. But if if I was to put myself in the, it would be a student that has the skills and the talents." to be able to do anything that they want, whether it's welding or teaching, whatever, but they have their, their language and culture right here in their heart. And to me, that's a, that's a successful, well-rounded Indigenous student. But a successful Indigenous student looks like any other student. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's not like they're, you know, uh, they're, the mainstream institutes are built, too, for are high achieving and 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 students that have that opportunity to go there and that's important that they have that you know we're not saying that they shouldn't come to seven gens or whatever but you know sometimes they need to go there's more opportunities at say an LU or or a Queens that uh you know that that they can be really specific on you know mm-hmm. maybe it's a very specific program that seven gens isn't able to 
uh, offer or, you know, or because it comes down to numbers and all that, mm-hmm. but it is there. So I think uh, one of the relationships between our Indigenous and non-Indigenous people are are really key in, in making uh, society and making uh, things better for the generations to come. I mean, if people understand each other more, they're going to, they're going to, know how to do things better and and from seven gens perspective i i believe that's a real important way to look at things is you know uh, i remember quite a few years ago we did a uh kind of a conference at old fort william and thunder bay and we invited uh you know grade eight nines and tens i believe it was it was just on, you know, what's working in schools, what isn't, those types of, you know, your general questions and that. And uh, <clears throat> these weren't your high achieving students. These were ones that were, you know, maybe had some struggles or were on the fence of going either way, successful or not. So at the end, they did a debriefing and there was these team leaders, for Indigenous te- students from Kong College, I think some from LU as well, and they were kind of the group leaders. And so they did a kind of a rundown of what was important and what would they do if we were able to do this again next year, what would they do? Every single one of them said, we'd like to have our non-Indigenous friends here. So to me, that spoke volumes because... As soon as you start separating and doing things specific for First Nations or specific for non-Indigenous, it just, you know, that's not the way the world, you know what I mean? Like, there's our, our First Nations, yeah, there's things that, you know, you can do and this and that, but let's not make that the focus. Let's make it working together. And, and that's why Seven Gens obviously is is open to anyone. It's not, you don't have to be First Nation to come here or, or Indigenous. That's an interesting question. That's a, it's kind of a tough question too. I mean, we ask our senior management and our board, and where do we see ourselves? Where do we see our institute 10 years from now? And, uh, uh, you know, obviously, I know one area is uh, the technical aspect, technology, and, and making sure that you have the programs, the tools, and those types of uh, opportunities for the students to be, because... You know, we talk about some of the training we've done for New Gold Mine, for example, and everybody thinks, well, you, you know, you pickaxe and a shovel. Well, no, it's computer based and it's, you know, this is how mining's done. We have a mining simulator where it's computer based. So the guy isn't even underground or the woman isn't even underground. Mm-hmm. And so those types of things, making sure that you have those opportunities because they need to train on what they're going to be using in the workforce and whether it's a a Mac computer or Microsoft, whatever it may be. Um, So having those types of things is really important. I think with, uh, as a whole, Indigenous education, um, I just think that there's, there's opportunities on on our communities. There's a lot of uh, untapped resources, uh, as I mentioned um, because the opportunities haven't been there. There hasn't been maybe positive relationships between whether it's a company and the First Nation or whatever it may be. Having those barriers broken down so there is that relationship, so there is uh, opportunity, whether it's a gold mine or a diamond mine or, or paper mill, whatever it may mm-hmm. be. Um, you know, uh, I think for, for our First Nations too, I think there's going to be greater opportunities for uh Careers like in, you know, not only law, but medicine, teaching, you know, one of the areas that's interesting that, you know, there's not a lot of First Nations or Indigenous teachers in Canada, let alone in Northwestern Ontario. So how do you, how do you, you know, promote that as a, as a viable career for, you know, someone on one of our First Nations you know, and and I and I think that's a you know there's lots of those types of opportunities that I think are going to come in the next ten years. But you know, I, I can't stress enough. I think that technology is going to be a huge thing, and and whether you're a mainstream institute, which they they know as well, not only indigenous but non indigenous, you know, the technology that's going to be here, you know, six months from now, you know, five years from now, mm-hmm. how do we prepare a, a, a young ones for that? You know, and 
Uh, one of the things they forget, though, too, is that the, the students that we're getting now have grown up with technology. So they, you know, it's not like it's going to be new to them, but we have to help them in a, in, in a stream or, or a way that they can they can find that support in whatever school they go to. Obviously, the language and culture is going to be a, a huge part of, of Indigenous education because, as I mentioned, you know, we talked about a little bit about Minobamatsuin and the good life, and but there's, I was telling you about the elders always working towards that. That You're not there, you're working towards it. So I think for our students, for Indigenous students, is knowing that type of processes and, and, and the, the teachings from their communities, from their elders, from their from their resource people on their communities to help so they still have that part of them as who they are you know where they come from they, there's a connection there's a ground groundedness for them um, you know and having our having our young folks you know as we mentioned earlier about daycares and fluency in the language and having those opportunities as they go into school so when they hit grade three their success their chances of success in graduating out of grade 12 are that much greater when they know their language and have that basis you know there's a connectivity there uh, with with the land with the culture with their ancestors so that's uh, that's another big part of uh, you know an overall not just education but that's an overall lifestyle and a way of living a way of knowing relationships to the land to the to to the world their views of the world um, all very important oh, I think with uh, with uh, Ontario recognizing the Indigenous Institutes as a third pillar the opportunities to support seven gens and the other eight institutes in Ontario will be will be uh, that much better um, you know the te- the technology parts of it uh, you know it's it's kind of a uh, you have to balance what labor market needs are community needs as an indigenous institute and what I mean by that is you know, if New Gold needs, if you look in the Fort Francis paper every Wednesday, there's this list of jobs in New Gold that they're looking for. Um, then you look at all the First Nations and, the, you know, they need anything from office admin to uh, social service worker to band manager, whatever it may be. Those are all the skill sets uh, that... Being a band manager, you have to wear a lot of different hats. You know, you have to know finance, you have to know proposals, you have to know a lot of different things. And so being able to to provide opportunities for people on their communities to be able to contribute to the economy, not only on their communities, but in society itself is important. But the labor market needs lots of times, in many cases, determine the direction of some of your programming. Like New Gold, for example, like we've done lots of different trainings, surface miner to, you, you know, office admin, culinary, for example. Like we look at our facility in Kenora. Uh, Kenora's got like 60 or 70 restaurants. They need people to work in those restaurants. Like the population and doubles there in the summertime. So they need, you know, from catering to chefs to assistant chefs to line cooks. So we all have we have to we have to watch all of that and and work with our businesses to say, okay, this is we really need, you know, uh uh, line cook training or whatever because they're all specifics i mean you think culinary but there's like red seal chef there's a sister chef there's banquet porter there's all these different things eh? so um so you really having that pulse and working with our, our business communities and and that helps determine where where you need to go um Again, and that's just, you know, uh, Fort Francis area, Kenora area and surrounding area, but then also the specific needs on our First Nations. Because First Nations, we we struggle too with finding the people, quality, that have the skills to, to succeed because I'm not sure if you know, but if you've ever uh, 
done reports for INAC or things like that. Like it, they're not just cut and dry. You, you know, you need to, <laughs> you need to, yeah, there, there's lots of details at times in specific areas. So um, we just have to continue to work with our leadership on our communities and, and the labor market needs and see where it goes from there. I think uh, because it's fairly new, uh, you know, we're eight months into a seven year strategy. Um, the important thing is that there, there's going to be some bumps in the roads or we're, we're going to have to, um, you know, make some adjustments as we as we move through this. But um, the, the, the really exciting thing about this is that our communities are, are, are full partners in this and helping, they'll help solve some of the the barriers or the or some of the roadblocks that we run into that we will need to rely on them to help us solve these and um so when you have everyone working together in a partnership for the same goals then it becomes something that you can do some pretty great things mm-hmm. and that's i think that's a, a really uh a neat way to look at it because uh, you know, we with the strategy, we're nowhere without our 10 First Nations being full partners in this. You know, it's not going to, Seven Gens isn't going to, um, you know, determine, the, uh, you know, whether it's successful or not. It's going to be everyone as a whole determining mm-hmm. whether it's going to be successful. And, and I think that's what's neat. So everybody's kind of going in the same direction and can see the end goal. How do we get there when these barriers come up? Mm-hmm. I think that's the big thing.